Well, today we're going to talk about something that is at God's very heart, and it is God's passion. God's passion. And God's passion, above all things, is for people. God is passionate about people. And we see this first in the scripture. We see a verse, um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. It talks about God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's desire above all things is that people would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And his heart is for every person on planet earth to know him and to have an intimate relationship with him. He didn't send Jesus just so one or two people could be saved. He sent Jesus so that every person could be saved. And the longing of his heart, the desire and the passion of his heart is for people to come to know him and to be saved because that's the beginning of knowing him is being saved. And once someone is saved, then they can enter into the fullness of a relationship with him and develop an intimate fellowship with him. But it all starts with people being saved. That's God's passion. That's his heart. Now, um, a, a verse that's very familiar to people, and it's a, a verse that um, probably you've heard, is a, a verse in John chapter 3, verse 16, that I want to read. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, in this verse, we see the whole motivation for God sending his Son, Jesus. It was because of his love. God has great love for people. God has great love for you. But God's love doesn't end with you. God's love is for every person. And God's love is for every person that you know. And you know people that need to hear God's love. You know people that need to see God's love demonstrated. You know people that you need to reach with God's love. And that's God's desire is that people would be saved so he sent his son, because of his great love, he sent his son to us so that we would be saved. He sent his son to die for us, and he gave him for us that we would be saved. Now, all through uh, man's relationship with God and God's relationship with man, we see God's love in demonstration. That has always been his, that's always been his motivation, and it's still his motivation. He loves the world. Now, religion has, um, you know, there have been a lot of preachers and a lot of um, you know, Bible teachers that have said things and, and really put an emphasis on God's, um, con, you know, they painted God as a condemning God and they put an emphasis on God as being a God who is angry and God who's out to get people, a God who's here to punish, and there's been a, and a God who's here to judge. And there's been such an emphasis through the years on God as a great judge. And people see him as, you know, God sitting on a, you know, basically sitting on a big throne with a big gavel ready to just, you know, pop anybody, bang anybody, punish anybody who might do a little wrong. But that's really not the heart of God. God's heart is love and his love is for people. And he's looking at people through eyes of love, not through condemning eyes, not through judging eyes. That idea of the God that's angry, that's ready to judge, who's out to get you, is a, is a God that really is not the God of the, of the New Testament. That's an idea that people have latched hold of, and it's been propagated from one person to another, and it's simply just not what the New Testament demonstrates as who God is. God is a loving God. And Jesus told us this. He said, for God so loved the world. He loves the world. And he, he sent Jesus because he loves people. That's his heart and that's his passion. And above all things, whenever we communicate with other people, um, anything about God, we need to be communicating his love for them. People have heard enough condemnation. People have been, you know, put down enough by Christians. People have been told enough. Well, you're, you're a sinner and you're going to hell and you're wrong. That's not the God, that's not the way God designed for us to reach out to people. God designed for us to reach out to people with his love because that's what he did. He didn't send his anger to the earth. He didn't send Jesus as a demonstration of his anger and his, and his judgment and his condemnation. He sent Jesus as a demonstration of his love. So therefore, he's sending us as his representatives. He's sending us as a demonstration of his love. He's not sending us as a demonstration of his, you know, judgy, of, a, of a judgmental, angry attitude towards men. He's sending us as representatives of his love. And, he, and he's expecting us, as we represent him to other people, to show forth his love and to demonstrate his love to people. And that's the attitude that we have. And that's the, the you know, um, 
the, the way that we move forward in, in ministering to people as we do it all from the same place that God did, the same motivation, His love, for God so loved the world. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, Amplified. But God, so rich you see in His mercy, because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which He loved us, even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, He made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ Himself, the same new life with which He quickened Him. For it is by grace, His favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation. You see, God so loved us, even when we weren't perfect, when we were sinners and His own enemies, God so loved us. He sent His only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us and take our place. This truly demonstrates His passion for people. He was able to overlook all of our mistakes, all of our sins, and all of our flaws. And He put everything on the line for us. You see, God had such an intense love for us that He refused to live without us. We'll begin reading in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. It says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now that to me shows so much the heart of God. He sent Jesus not to die for good people. He didn't send Jesus as a sacrifice for people who were keeping the law. He didn't send Jesus as, a, you know, as, as the one who needed to pay the price for people who had sinned just a smidgen, just a little bit, but generally they were pretty good people. No, He sent Jesus to die for the ungodly. Well, who are the ungodly? Well, everybody who's born on planet Earth is ungodly because we were born from ungodly seed. So we all showed up here in an ungodly state, and then we've all done our best to maintain that ungodly state. We've lived our lives, you know, on our own without Christ. We live our lives as sinners, and we're ungodly. And these are the people, these ungodly people are the very people that Jesus came to die for. These are the very people that Christ came for. The, the very people that Jesus died for are the ungodly people. People. Now, we have the tendency to look at people and measure people by our standards. And, you know, um, oftentimes when, you, when we are even talking to people, I know uh, at times I've asked people what we call the million-dollar question, if you died today or 100 years from now, would you go to heaven? And when you ask people a question like that, you get all kind of answers. And, and often you get an answer, yeah, I'd, I'll go to heaven. And you go, oh, okay, well, do you mind me asking you why? And in so many times this is the answer to that question, well, I'm a good person. And some people will say, I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody. Like, unless I've killed somebody, then I'm okay. So that's their standard. Murder is the thing that puts you in hell, that sends you to hell. But any other sin, you know, that's okay. But, you know, Jesus in the, in the New Testament said that even if you think of doing something, even if you, you know, imagine it in your mind that it's counted as if you've done it. So... We've all thought of murdering somebody. We've all, you know, had that moment where if we could strangle somebody, we would just, you know, in, the, in a fit of anger. Not that we did it, but we, we, you know. So the reality is even on according to what the Bible says, even if you've even thought of it, you're guilty of it. In other words, we're all guilty of sin. The sins we've committed, the sins we thought of committing, we're all ungodly. But we have these standards that we apply to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. You know, we say, hey, you know, I haven't done this, I haven't done that. And then on the other hand, I ask people, if you died today or 100 years from now, would you go to, would you go to heaven? And I've had people kind of look at, you know, sort of drop their head and say, well, no, I wouldn't go to heaven. I'd go to hell. And I'd say, why? And they'd say, I've been a bad person. And, you know, sometimes they tell me what that means, that so they've been a bad person. I'm like, I don't want to hear anymore. But other times, you know, I'm like, <laughs> please don't tell me that. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes the things people say are, are, are really in some ways just insignificant. And you, and, I mean, they're sin, but, you know, I'm thinking, really? The devil has been using that thing just to beat you up. You, you have disqualified yourself from going to heaven because of what you've done. But see, here's the deal. It's not what you've done that's sending you to hell. It's you not accepting Jesus that's sending you to hell. And once you take people through the gospel and the heart of the gospel and show them that the only way to heaven is through Jesus 
Um, I'm telling you, it brings such life to people. We actually do give life to people with, with giving them the gospel. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that awesome? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, the fact that God took action on his love really for you and me should be a lesson. It should be really a challenge to us because we all have people in our lives that we love. And we feel love towards them. We have loving feelings towards them. Some of them, we even tell them that we love them. We'll express loving words to them. But love is more than a feeling. And love is more than words. Love is an action. And, and God's, his love for people drove him to the action of giving his son, sending his son to die for people. So our love for people should, should bring us to a point of action. It should get us up. It should cause us to take action and to do something, just like it did for God. And we should put on a demonstration of our love for people. Our love for people should be demonstrated in us sharing the most vital truth that we could ever share with somebody, which is the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for us, that Jesus came and he gave his life for your sins because he loves you. He paid the penalty for your sins so that you could have his life. That we need to communicate to people. We need to take action based on um, the love that we have for people, just like God took action and demonstrated his love towards us. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise God. Romans 5, 5 says that that same love that God has for people, his same heart for people, his same passion for people, that same love he's put in our hearts. In fact, I love the, the illustration that Paul made there. He's poured that love out in us. When the Holy Spirit came in us, he poured God's love out in us. So we, therefore, are able to love people the same way that God loves people. We're able to have the same passion for people to be saved that God himself had when he gave Jesus. That same love, that same desire, that same passion is in us. Not because we work it up, not because we fake it, but because the Holy Spirit has poured that out in us. So it's just really a matter of you connecting with what the Holy Spirit's poured out in you, which is the love of God, that same love that compelled him to give his only son. That love is in us and will compel us to go and give life wherever we go. So really one of the, one of the steps in being a life giver is tapping into the love of God that's been poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit. When you tap into that and that love begins to flow, it will make you a life giver. It will transform you and cause you to be a life giver. You don't have to work it up. It's not a matter of, you know, I really ought to do this. This would be the right thing. God wants me to do this. This is the job or the commission he's given me. No, it's really, I just invite you to tap into the love of God that's already in you. And when you do that and start looking at people the way God sees them, you'll be a life giver. We can't stop you from being a life giver. The devil himself won't be able to thwart your efforts to be a life giver because that love will compel you. Now, I want to read to you what is what I call the most unbelievable scripture in the Bible. Now, I know there's a lot of scriptures and some of them are hard to understand and some of the scriptures, when you read them, you're, you're kind of perplexed. There's some scriptures that are hotly debated, you know, and that's sort of, they're sort of controversial and people are, they, they're interpreting them in almost opposing ways. But this verse that I'm going to read, this, this, this I'm going to read here is actually from the words of Jesus. And he said something in, in the 17th chapter of John that to this day, I've been a Christian for 40 plus years, but to this day, I still have trouble grasping the reality of what Jesus said. It is such a challenge to me to even believe what he said. And when I, when I, when I share it with you, probably you're going to find it a challenge too. Or you may say, oh yeah, I know that. But there's a difference between knowing it and really believing it and really getting settled down into the reality of what I'm about to share to, with you. And it's over in John chapter 17. And it's part of a prayer. It's something that Jesus actually said to the Father as he was praying. And in John 17 and verse... Well, verse 20, Jesus is, is, is praying along and he, and, he, and he makes this statement. He said, I do not pray for these alone. 
Now, at this time, he's at the what we would call the Last Supper. He's there with those that are closest to him, those that have walked with him throughout his earthly ministry, and he's praying for them. But he says this statement, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, what you might not realize is in that moment, Jesus was praying for you and me because you and me believe in Jesus because of what we have heard about him that originally came from the people who were sitting there that day having dinner. Those people who were with him at that time and gathered with him, if you continue to read through the Gospels and then you get into the book of Acts, you see that these are the people that went out from there and began to share the good news of what Jesus has done for us. So on the, their words, on the basis of what they said, we have come to the knowledge of God that we have. We've come to the reality of um, what Jesus has done for us based on their words. And so you and me are in that verse, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me. Ha ha. Now it's going to get a lot better. In the New Living Translation, if you keep on reading and you come down to um, verse 23 in the New Living Translation, he made this statement. He said that the world will know that you sent me. Well, that's you know, the world today, maybe you even at one point in your life had difficulty even believing that God had sent Jesus. Maybe you didn't even believe in Jesus. Maybe it took you a while to sort of grasp the um, truth that, that Jesus existed and he really is the son of God. But he, you know, I, I hope you've grasped that. I hope you've received Jesus as God's son and you've put your faith and trust in him as your Lord and Savior. But he didn't end there. He said that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. I'm going to read that again. And that you love them as much as you love me. Do you see that? God loves the world. People that are still trapped in sin, people that are still dead in their trespasses and sins, God loves the people of the world as much. Jesus himself said this. This isn't somebody else writing it. Jesus said, God, the Father, loves them as much as he loves me, Jesus. That's what Jesus said. God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Now, that's just hard to imagine. That's just hard to even get your mind around. That's why I said this is the most unbelievable scripture in the Bible to me because how could God love me? Let's just start with me. How could God love me as much as he loves Jesus? That just seems unbelievable to me. How? I mean, I, I read that in the Bible. I know God loves me. And it's one thing to say God loves me, but it's a whole other thing to say God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. But I can tell you, there's, there, I have proof that he loves me as much as he loves Jesus. And the proof is that he sent Jesus to die for me. He would never have been able to give Jesus to die for me. He would never have had put, put into you know, um, action, put, um, put into being the, the, the plan of salvation, the whole plan of redemption. He would never have been able to do that if he had not been motivated by his great love for me because he loved Jesus. And how could he offer up his son Jesus for me unless he had love for me? For he loves, and, it, and, this, and Jesus said that, that you love them as much as you love me. He loves us as much as he loves Jesus. Well, that's the attitude. See, I started to understand once I, once I got a hold of the fact that God loves me as much as he loves Jesus, I started to understand why he could offer Jesus as a sacrifice. I never understood why Jesus could be offered as a sacrifice for me. Why would God do it? I mean, I know God is good. I know God is holy. I know God is, you know, noble and he's way beyond in his goodness anything that I could even ever be. But yet, if he really loved Jesus, how could he give Jesus up for sinners? How could he sacrifice Jesus for ungodly people? Because, you know, maybe as ungodly as I've ever been or as ungodly as you've ever been, that doesn't compare to as ungodly as some people have been. I mean, there have been people who have done terrible, horrible things. I mean, there have been people who've been responsible for the deaths of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people tortured and, and gassed and burned and bombed and, and, and just terrible catastrophe. But Jesus died for those people. Jesus died for the worst mass murderer that ever has, ever has been. And it doesn't make any sense unless you understand that God loves that person, the mass murderer. God loves them as much as he loves Jesus. It makes no sense to me. That's just unbelievable. It's beyond me. But God, that's the love of God. 
We don't, we don't understand God's love. That's why Paul prayed and the prayers he prayed in Ephesians 3, that we would begin to understand the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of God's love. Because really, that's something for eternity we're still going to be figuring out, God's love. But God's love, his passion towards people, his, his longing for people, that, that's something that we face every day because not only is he passionate towards us, but he's passionate for the people that we know. He's passionate towards the people in our lives. He's passionate about people hearing the gospel. He wants people to hear the gospel. And so it's up to us to tell them. We're the only ones that he can depend on to tell them. Now, God obviously sees something in people that we don't see. Because we look at people and we think, oh, that's a sinner. Oh, that's an ungodly person. Or we look at, we look at people and think, oh, they're vile, they're wretched. We have those thoughts of people. God doesn't see that when he looks at people. God sees treasure. God sees something of immense value. And I, I believe the more that we hang out with God, the more that we get into his word, the more that we spend time in his presence, the more we'll see the treasure in other people. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables to the religious people of the day. And he does this to paint a picture of God's passion for people. The religious people had seen Jesus eating with the tax collectors and sinners. They muttered to themselves about that. They made some comments about that. And they were clearly upset, visibly upset, at Jesus hanging out with the bad guys. And the people who were uh, so-called unworthy but yet Jesus chose to spend his time with them. And to answer the Pharisees and the scribes, he tells them three parables to show God's passion for people. Luke 15, verse 1, he says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And you can see just the, uh, the audacity of the religious people to mutter among themselves and say, oh, well, this guy, he's eating with sinners and he's, he's hanging out with the, the bad people or the wrong type of people and they're so quick to make a judgment. And Jesus comes right back and he's, he's teaching this parable to the religious people. And he says this in verse 4, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And he's telling this to, to the religious people, to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees, because he knows what they're thinking. Why am I eating with sinners? Why am I eating with... Um, why am I eating with the tax collectors? These people who were, um, who, were, who were looked down upon by the religious folks. And Jesus paints this picture of a shepherd. Loses one sheep out of, nine, out of 100. 99 he's going to leave behind. And he's going to go looking, searching, passionately trying to find the one that's lost. Now sheep are dumb. Uh, it's very dangerous for a sheep to get lost because a sheep's not like a dog. It's not going to come back to its master. And so um, the shepherd has to go looking for the sheep. And the shepherd does so. And the shepherds, the shepherds were the superhero. I mean, what, what strength must it have taken for the shepherd when he finds the sheep to lift it upon his, on his shoulders? I mean, what a hulk, right? Um, what brute strength. And then he carries it, carries it home. And then he, he shouts throughout the neighborhood, guess what, I've got my lost sheep. And they throw a party, he has a, a huge celebration. And Jesus likens this to the party that's in heaven over one sinner who repents. And the Pharisees must have been thinking about the, um, the attitude and the heart with, with which they looked upon the tax collectors and sinners. It had them thinking about, well, this must be God's heart for people. And so therefore, we must have the same heart. And I'd like to think that it changed them, but uh, I don't think it got the point across that well because Jesus continued and he got stronger with the parable. And he goes on in verse 8, he says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? 
And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In the same manner, the, the woman who lost her coin. Now, think about this coin. In this day, this would be worth a day's wages for this particular person, for this particular woman. If you lose a day's worth of wages, you're not going to stop until you find it. And so she's looking all over the house. She, she lights the lamp. She sweeps the house. She, she, she searches carefully until she finds it. I don't know if you've ever lost anything, but I've uh, lost a number of things. And maybe you've lost the keys to your car once. Well, if you're in a hurry to get somewhere, you're not just going to say, well, I'll, I'll walk or, you know, I'll ride my bike. You're, if you're traveling a, a, a long distance, you're going to do whatever it takes to find that lost set of keys. And in the same manner, this woman is doing whatever it takes to find her lost coin because it's valuable to her. It's precious to her. It's something that she needs and she desires. And so she's going after it with everything that she has. And this is the same imagery that Jesus paints when he's, when he's talking about all of heaven rejoicing over one sinner who repents because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost and he does that with passion and with purpose because the lost are valuable to him the lost are precious to to him and that's what he wants to get across to these religious people is how precious these people that he's eating with how precious they are to him how valuable they are to him and how valuable they are to heaven and I love this because what does what does heaven get excited about? I heard a preacher say one, one time, there's only one thing that makes heaven holler. And I love that. There really is only one thing that makes heaven holler, and it's a changed life. It's a sinner who comes to, uh, comes to repentance and comes to God. And that's what makes the angels rejoice. That's what makes all of heaven rejoice. And that should make us rejoice too. There's one other story in this passage, and it, it's, a, it's, it's one of the most powerful stories that Jesus told. It's in Luke 15. Um, it's the story of the prodigal. And, and uh, if you have never read this or meditated on it a huge amount, I, I, I recommend that you do. It in, starts in verse 11. It says, A certain man and two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants would have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he rose and came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You see this. This father represents our heavenly father. This father represents God's heart towards people. And here he is. He's looking and his eyes are scanning the horizon, looking for his family, looking for his loved ones, looking for people that he's so passionate about. And he sees his son beginning to come. And, it, and he arose, this, this, this son, as he arose and he came to his father, the father rose up, he saw him, and his father had compassion on him and he ran to him. I keep thinking about the father. He's going out to the porch every day and he's, he gets out there and he's on the edge of his seat just looking for his son. He can't get anything done. He can't get any work done. The, the farm is falling apart. He just keeps thinking about his lost son. His son is gone. He, where is he? When's he going to come home? He's just out there every day. He's, he's in the rocking chair looking out over the back 40. And then finally one day he looks out and he sees something in the distance. Could that be? Could that be my son? And finally he sees that it is his son. He just can't wait. He gets up from his chair. He just gets excited. He just runs at him and says, my son, my son, he's lost, been found. He was dead. And now he's alive. Now in their culture, 
the, the elder would never get up and run to the, to the younger. That would never happen. The, the, the proper way of things, the proper order of things would be for the father to sit and for the son to approach the father. But for the father to get up from where he was and to run to the son is really a living demonstration of God's passion towards us. He's running towards us now. He's running towards people. That's what he did when he sent Jesus. He ran towards people. He did what this father did. He ran towards people. And he's still today running towards people. And he's doing it through me and you. He's using us as his arms and his legs to run towards people and to carry the gospel, his love, the message of his forgiveness towards people. And that's it's what he's still doing today. And when the son, the verse 21 says, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And then if you go on down and read in verse 32, he said, it was right that we should make merry and be glad. That's the heart of God. He's making merry and he's glad because people have turned to him. One day I had a friend come to church and she was very upset about her husband. They had been having problems. He was very angry. He was in the military, had been deployed several times. You, I could tell that it affected him what happened when he was over there. And I got to meet him and you could just see in his eyes just anger, hurt, pain. In my heart, I just felt like I wanted to reach out to him. He wasn't a believer and um, he really didn't want to have anything to do with God. But God still loved him so much. And uh, as I was thinking about it and praying about it, I said, God, you know, what can I do to reach out to him? Because, you know, his, his wife tried to reach out to him, you know, many times, but he was just not open. So what, what would help him be open? So in my heart, I knew the best way to reach him was to write him a letter. And in the letter, I just shared my heart. I shared that God loved him so much and cared about his situation, what he was going through and the hurt and the pain that he had. And that Jesus died on the cross for him and, and gave himself up for him and that he would give him anything. Um, I told him that every person has troubles and problems and that God was there to help him with his problems. And so, when I wrote this letter, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen with it. I gave it to my friend and I said, you know, just give it to him and see what happens. So I didn't hear anything after a couple of days. And then on the third day, my friend called me up and said, hey, my husband wants to talk to you. So he called me and I was able to talk to him. You could just hear in his voice he was ready. He was at that breaking point and he wanted to get help from God, from Jesus. And so I was able to pray the prayer of salvation with him right there over the phone. And you could hear in his voice a difference that he had freedom and happiness that he hadn't had before. And it completely changed him in that moment. Um, after that, he was, he was coming to church with his wife and you could see a visible difference on his face that he was, that, that depression and that loneliness, hurt, and pain was gone out of his eyes, and God was there to help him. Um, and I had no idea that six months later, after he got saved, that he would pass away. And it just made me really thankful that when I felt that urgency in my heart and that compassion in my heart for him, that I was obedient to write that letter. And now I know for sure that he's in heaven. Now. I'm going to close with just a couple of verses. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says this. In the Amplified Version, it's talking about how we're God's, we're Christ's ambassadors. And in the Amplified Version, it's, it, it says this. In the very last part of uh, verse 20, it says, For we are Christ's ambassadors, God making His appeal as it were through us. We are Christ's personal representatives, and we beg you, for his sake, to lay hold of the divine favor that's now offered to you and to be reconciled to God. 
It's interesting that in writing this, Paul used the word beg. That's an unusual word. You wouldn't think that we would be beggars for anything. But it's God making his appeal through us comes across to people as if we were begging them to be reconciled to God. It's not a haughty, arrogant, well, you're a sinner and you need to come to God. You need to repent. It's not that at all. It's be reconciled to God. Receive what the Father has. Come home to, to the Father. Come and, come and receive the love that God has for you. Come and, come and know His goodness. Come back to the house. Come back into fellowship with God. Be, be, receive what Jesus has done for you. It's, it's a begging that's coming through us. And you know, and when you're begging people, you're not all um, uh, up and, and high and mighty. You're, even your position and your disposition is, is low. You're, you're begging and that's what God is doing through us to, to the unbeliever, he, to the ungodly. He's begging them, be reconciled to God. Please be reconciled to God. And that's what God is desiring from us, that we would re let him reach out through us to reach other people. And, and so often we've just tried to share the gospel in a way that's kind of like give people some facts. But really the facts, we're not, we're not just trying to give people facts. We're, we're showing people God's heart. And God's heart is towards people. And that, so we're not just there to give them some facts. We're not just there to say, well, here's the four spiritual laws. And you, you, know, you need to understand this. No, we're, we're there to, to, to really make God's heart for them known. To show them his heart. And then finally, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. Thank God he's not slack. But is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, that, but that all should come to repentance. This just seals it. He wants all men to be saved. We read when we started, and now it says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants every person to know Jesus. He doesn't want anyone to die and go off into a Christless eternity. He doesn't want any person to go to hell. God wants every person to come to repentance. He wants them to make that turn towards him. Every person. And he wants us to let him work through us, to empower us, to enable us to reach people. That is his very heart. And so it's really for me and you to make the decision to align our will with his will. Not my will, just like Jesus said, not my will be done, but your will. Not my will, but your will be done. And when it comes to reaching people, not my will, but your will be done. And it's your will that all men be saved. And it's your will that not one would perish. It's, it's your will that not one person would be lost, but that all would come to repentance and be restored to the Father. That's the will of God. So I'm just you know, begging you today to align your will with his and to determine that the people that God puts into your pathway, that you'll reach them, that you'll open up your heart towards them and you will show that passion and love that God has for them. You will allow him to show that through you. And, and then you will open up yourself in a way that will allow God to use you to speak to them or to minister to them in whatever way that... that, that um, that you're able to in whatever way that he can use you. But here, this is your determination that I'd like you to make. This is what I'm asking all of us to decide. Let's make it hard for people to go to hell. Let's make it hard for the people you know to go to hell. Let's make it hard for the people in your pathway to go to hell. Let's make it hard for your family members to go to hell. Let's make it hard for the people you work with to go to hell, the, the people you go to school with, the people that live in your neighborhood, the people that shop where you shop. Let's make it hard for those people to go to hell. Because right now, if nobody's reaching them with the gospel, it's easy for them to go to hell. But let's make it hard. Let's be an obstacle in, the, in their pathway towards hell. Let's stand in there and say, no, God loves you. God's passionate towards you. And let's just, instead of just saying it, let's open up our lives and let's show them and demonstrate to them by our actions and by sharing the gospel with them. God loves you. He's passionate towards you. He's not condemning you. He is that father that we see in the prodigal story. He's the father with the arms open wide. He's ready to receive you. He's ready to welcome you home.
I just want to share a little bit of um, Bobby's testimony that he shared with me. Uh, he came to the salon uh, this past Saturday. And um, he said he didn't know why he came by, but he, he just wanted to come by and see me. And uh, we started talking, and he asked me about cutting my grass. And before he went out to cut my grass, um, I had this urge inside of me to talk to him about what God has done in my life and what he could do in his life. I shared with him about what God did. He sent his son to, to the cross to die for our sins. And I just explained to him, you know, the, the process that God did. He sent his only son, his only begotten son to die for us on the cross. And then I asked him if he he believed in God. And he said, yes. I said, um, have you ever asked God to come into your heart? He said, no, he's never done that. So I said, would you like to? He said, yes. Then we just said a simple prayer. You know, he repeated after me and he accepted God and asked God to come into his heart and to to lead him. And then he, um, you know, I, I cut his hair and then he went outside to cut the grass. And um, I just told him just to do a you know, a quick get ahead and have to be perfect or anything, just kind of knock the grass down a little bit. And I didn't know what he was doing out there. He was out there for a long time, two and a half to three hours. When he came in, I said, Bobby, what, what were you doing? He said, what did you do to me? I said, what do you mean? He says, Jose, I I can't explain what's going on. He, he said, it's just this feeling that I have is just amazing I've never felt this way before he said this is weird and um and he started to proceed to tell me what was going on I said hold on a second I, I have to record you did you did you ask God to come into your life it's hard for me to say yet yeah, yeah. I, I, I do believe God has come in, into my life um, it, it's, it's weird, I mean, I can't explain it, now that, you know, you prayed for me, you know, I would have never done this, um, I'm not what you call a Jesus freak, uh, I've always believed in him, but my belief is higher now, uh, and I feel like I'm walking on clouds, so to speak. In other words, the sky's the limit. And I knew that God was working in his life. And he went home, and I said, Bobby, it'll wear off. And he said, no, I hope not. He went home, and um, he, he called me the next day. He says um, uh, he apologized because he was going to come to my house and cut the grass. And his brakes went out, and the enemy tried to take his life. And uh, he, he had to work on his truck. And then he also told me about what God was doing in his life. He said, I'm feeling higher today. I feel just like I did yesterday. He said, I took my medication and it didn't work. He said, I, I don't think I have to take it anymore. And he asked me what he should do. And I said, Bobby, I can't tell you that. I said, that's between you and God. And maybe you need to consult your doctor. But, but pray about it and, and let God lead you. And um, God was working in his life, I know, and I, I don't know exactly what he shared with his family, but his mom called me and thanked me for um, talking to him because she could see a difference in his life. And, um, and I know that God was working. And then I get a, a call on Tuesday. This happened on Saturday. I, I get a call on Tuesday. I was working, and his, um, his dad called me. He said, Jose, uh, call me. This is Chris. And... and uh, some, my heart just dropped. I didn't know what was going on. So when I finished working, I called him that evening, and he told me what happened. It was tragic. You know, Bobby went home to be with the Lord. Heaven is having a party right now. They're throwing a party for him. Now he's really seeing exactly what was going on. It's not weird to him anymore. He's have, He has all the benefits, and he's just, I know he's rejoicing right now in heaven. So I just want to thank God for giving me the opportunity to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. 
And I want to just let every one of you know that if you have that, that feeling, that, that little small voice speaking to you, listen to it. Don't ignore it. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Because that could have been a life lost. And God doesn't want any of us to perish. He wants for us to have life and life more abundant. And how more abundant could it be but just to be in heaven? And one day, I'll be up there too, Bobby. Thank you.